see your genius right at the moment. You play Richmond? I think they're ready to go. Oh, we're doing ready to go. Are you first? I'm not. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Please rise for the uh, invocation. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather this day as a thankful people, thankful for all you have done for this institution, for the people who have loved it throughout the years, and all of those whose lives have been enriched by their time here. For all of this, we give you thanks. This day, we once again begin a new year seeking your guidance for safety of our students, faculty, and staff, and for your help in achieving our given goal to help, instruct, guide, and care for those given into our homes. Help us, Lord, so that all gathered here will achieve the goal of being good men and good citizens while being their brothers, helpers, and keepers. Amen. Please remain standing for the playing of our national anthem. I'm going to read some excerpts from the college's first advertisement. By the generous exertions of several gentlemen in this and some of the neighboring counties, very large contributions have lately been made for erecting and supporting a public academy near the courthouse in this county. A very valuable library of the best writers both ancient and modern, on most parts of science and polite literature, is already procured. With part of an apparatus to facilitate the studies of mathematics and natural philosophy, which we expect in a short time to render complete. It is to be distinguished by the name of Hampton Sydney. The system of education will resemble that which is adopted in the College of New Jersey save that more particular attention shall be paid to the cultivation of the English language than is usually done in places of public education. For our fidelity in every respect, we are cheerfully willing to pledge our reputation to the public, which may be the more relied on, because our whole success depends upon their favorable opinion. Our character and interest, therefore, being both at stake furnish a strong security for our avoiding all party instigations, and our care to form good men and good citizens on the common and universal principles of morality. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. A very warm welcome to this opening convocation and the start of the 2023-24 academic year. We also offer a very special welcome to the newest members of our community, the class of 2027. Today, we not only begin a new academic year, but we also begin a three-year celebration of the 250th anniversary of the founding of this college, 
that will culminate during the 25-26 academic year. The theme of our anniversary celebration is civic virtue. As our first president, Samuel Stanhope Smith, was working tirelessly in 1775 to open this college, he penned the advertisement for Hampton Sydney, the excerpts of which Patrick Strike just read. As that advertisement makes clear, Smith and the founders of the college, who were also some of the most important founders of our country, were convinced that good men and good citizens would be needed for their bold experiment in representative democracy to succeed. They knew that to be led by a king or a tyrant, one only needs to be an acquiescing follower. But our founders' reading of the history and the ancient and enlightenment philosophers had convinced them that if people are to govern themselves, they would have to be a virtuous people led by virtuous people. That's why just a few months after Smith's advertisement appeared, John Adams was asking in a letter to a friend whether there is, quote, public virtue enough to support a republic. And that's why in 1781, he wrote to his own son, John Quincy, at Harvard to remind him that, again, quote, the end of study is to make you a good man and useful citizen. And that is why, as our Constitutional Convention was concluding on another hot summer day in 1787, Benjamin Franklin noted that, quote, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. Perhaps even more urgently today, we need virtuous people to lead our republic and to serve and lead every other institution in this country, as well as our families and communities. So our mission and our work are every bit as important today as they were in 1775. And my use of that word work is very deliberate. One does not become a good man and a good citizen simply by passing through the college gates or by wearing a Hampton Sydney shirt or belt. Rather, it is through our daily work here, absorbing the lessons of history, learning about our shared humanity, developing an appreciation for beauty, studying our physical and natural world, and adopting our codes of honor and conduct as a way of life that you become good men and good citizens. You can think of your courses as tasks that you have to do, but if you instead think about everything you do here, your courses, your involvement in clubs and activities, the leadership roles you assume, your attendance at lectures and other events, your participation in the social life for the college, and even your workouts as the process by which you become a good man and good citizen, then your time here will be well spent and you will like the man you are becoming. In just a few minutes, we'll hear a charge for this academic year from Tommy Bishop, our student body president. We'll then present awards to some of our most meritorious students. And we are thrilled to have with us this afternoon the Honorable John Charles Thomas, who will deliver our keynote address entitled, The Liberal Arts or the Skills of Freedom. First, though, we will inaugurate the good men and good citizens who have been elected to serve in our student government, which Princeton Review rates as the number one most active student government among the 389 best colleges and universities in this country. So please, Cal, call, please stand as I call your name and remain standing until you take your oath. First, the executive student leaders, please stand as I call your name. Thomas B. Bishop, President of the Student Government. Grayson Hurley, Chairman of the Student Court. Andrew Blankenship, Chairman of the Student Senate. Joshua McCoy, Secretary Treasurer of the Student Government. And William P. Harrison, Chairman, College Activities Council. And members of the Student Senate, please stand as I call your name. Drew Duffy, Thomas Kelly, Cody Carnes, Ethan Hopp, Edwin Peacock, Brady Hillis, 
Eric Hayerbo, Devin Modak, and members of the student court, please also stand as I call your name. Herbert Lafayette, George Langhammer, Bryson Smith, Connor Bond, Sam Dietrich, William Gardner, Cooper Daniels, Clayton Mullen, Owen Williams, and lastly, members of the College Activities Council, please stand as I call your name. John Alexander, Yaron Concepcion, Nathaniel Kanya, Charles Adams, Connor Kitson, Jack Wright, Isaac Drummond, Brandon Finch, Russell Hager. Now will you all please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do faithfully promise to execute to the best of my ability the duties entrusted to me to the office of which I have been elected at Hampton Sydney College. Congratulations, gentlemen. Thank you for your service. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Richard Panley, Dean of Students, to the lectern. Good afternoon to you all. It is a pleasure to have the opportunity to add my own welcome both to our returning students as well as our newest brothers in the class of 2027. We are all looking forward to what will surely be a wonderful new year ahead. One of the most rewarding aspects of working for the college and being a part of this community and this brotherhood is being able to witness the countless and diverse examples of how our students put into action our mission of forming good men and good citizens in an atmosphere of sound learning, our codes of honor and conduct, and our students supporting each other as our brother's keeper. As many of you often hear me say, the virtue of the Hampton Sydney student does not lie in his ability to simply recite our mission or our codes, but rather his virtue lies in putting those things into action. Doing the right thing always is an essential part of this equation with the understanding that more times than not, the right thing to do rarely involves the easiest decision. Today, it is my great honor to highlight the actions of one of our students who has gone above and beyond the application of our college's mission. During the fall break of last academic year, this student witnessed a person physically intimidating a group of young women in downtown area of Raleigh, North Carolina, and chose to intervene without regard for his personal safety. While successful in his intervention, he ultimately sustained numerous injuries which resulted in his brief departure from the college. Having returned to the college last semester, the student worked valiantly and vigorously towards his recovery and re-engagement with the Brotherhood in our campus community, which I am very glad to say he has done with great success. As a result of his act of heroism and bravery, it is an honor to be able to present a commendation and resolution for heroism and bravery voted on by the college's board of trustees to Mr. Dawson Hughes McElhenney, class of 2026. Mr. McElhenney will join me on stage and I will read to him the commendation. Congratulations. Proud of you. To Dawson Hughes McElhenney, 
Whereas Dawson H. McElhenney is a member of the Hampton Sydney class of 2026 from Greensboro, North Carolina, and whereas Dawson H. McElhenney is an outstanding student athlete and member of the Tiger basketball team, and whereas Dawson H. McElhenney during the college's fall break in October 2022 witnessed a person physically intimidating a group of young women in the downtown area of Raleigh, North Carolina, and chose to intervene with out regard to his personal safety, and whereas Dawson H. McElhenney, in his selfless intervention as a responsible, a responsible and active bystander, sustained multiple bodily injuries resulting in his temporary withdrawal from the college, and whereas Dawson H. McElhenney has recovered from his physical injuries and returned to the college effective spring 2023, and whereas Dawson H. McElhenney McElhenney has recovered from his, excuse me, I just repeated myself, sorry, whereas Dawson H. McElhenney, through his act of extreme courage and decisive defense of individuals in danger, has demonstrated the highest character of a Hampton Sydney man. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the trustees of Hampton Sydney College, do here record our commendation for Dawson Hughes McElhenney, for his extraordinary bravery bold actions, and selfless character relating to his decisions to act on behalf of others at his own peril. Further, it be resolved that these resolutions be spread across the minutes of these proceedings and that an attested copy of these resolutions be forwarded to Mr. Dawson Hughes McElhenney in token of our esteem and as an expression of our deep admiration for his courage and for exemplifying the good men and good citizen that Hampton Sydney works to form. Resolved this 21st day of August in the year of our Lord, 2023. Mr. McElhenney, congratulations. It is now my pleasure to welcome your student body president, Mr. Tommy Bishop, to the lectern. Gentlemen, I would like to begin by extending a warm welcome to each and every one of you as we return to the Hill for the 2023-2024 academic year. I would especially like to welcome the class of 2027, the future of Hampton Sydney College. You all have made the decision to etch your name into history alongside renowned men who have come before you. I challenge you to not take this lightly. Soon, you will all realize that you have discovered a new home here on this hill. You have joined a brotherhood that is much larger than just yourselves. You will meet friends that will last a lifetime and make memories that you will never forget. It is important to recognize that change and transition are important aspects of life. Look after your new brothers during this time. In your first year, you have every opportunity on this campus. I challenge all of you to go out and find what that is, whether it be a sport, a club, student government, or research. There is something for everyone. I still remember the first day that I have set foot on campus as a freshman. I traveled from Jacksonville, Florida with my parents to move into a small school in South Central Virginia. But I quickly realized that this hill is far more than just that. It is a place that will challenge you as an individual in every way you can imagine. You will learn to think for yourselves and not make arguments based on speculation, but rather reason and thought. You will learn to live by the honor code which you have signed, the honor code that stands as the backbone of this institution. Every day it seems that the world pushes and pulls us in different directions, attempting to show us how to lead our lives. It is often said that this world needs more Hampton Sydney men, men who have the ability to think and speak for themselves. I believe this statement to be true now more than ever. Our professors and faculty at Hampton Sydney College are second to none. What truly makes them stand out is their availability to you and their wishes to see you succeed. 
The biggest shame in four years would be not taking advantage of this at every moment that you can. The phrase that Hampton Sydney turns boys into men is far more than just a slogan used during recruitment. I have witnessed this transition in my years spent on this hill. Whatever it is that interests and engages you, this is a place where you can pursue it. If it is a club, approach the Senate to create it. If it is research, find a pro professor to speak with about it. Every single one of us has passions and interests, but we must learn to be curious to a further extent. We must have a desire to find answers. Hampton Sydney gives us the ability to do just that. In doing so, we truly do recognize the transformation from boys to men that we have heard so much about. To my fellow seniors, this is our final lap. We will have stresses from job interviews, graduate school, and the feeling that we have blinked and the years have passed us by. So let us take full advantage of the time that we do have left. As my grandfather always said, do not squander time because time is the one thing that they're not making any more of. To the Tigers to come after us, this message remains the same. One day we will all look back on our years spent on this hill and laugh about the good old days. Make sure everyone can say that we took full advantage of the opportunities presented to us. Challenge yourself to live in the moment throughout this year. Speak to that person. Join that club. Seek out that professor. Whatever you choose to do this year, whatever it is that sparks that interest in your mind, do it well, do it with excellence, and thrive. Roll Tigers. Thank you, Tommy. As we pr prepare now to present the awards, would the following individuals please join us on the field as your name is called? Davy Clark, Cade Minton, Devin Modak, William Preston Morris, Daniel Robinson Nivens, John Michael Rowe, Patrick Robert Streit, John Atwood Torian, J.E. Jeb Tucker, Mr. Tommy Shamo, and Dr. Mike Waliniak. The first awards to be presented are the Samuel S. Jones Phi Beta Kappa Awards, which are made possible through the generosity of Sam Jones, a member of the class of 1943 who endowed these awards to recognize intellectual achievement and good citizenship at the college. Please come forward when your name is announced. The Samuel S. Jones Award typically goes to the junior with the highest and second highest cumulative grade point average. However, we have two juniors this year who both have earned a cumulative grade point average of 4.0. Our first recipient is a biology major, and our second recipient is a double major in applied mathematics and engineering physics. On behalf of our Phi Beta Kappa chapter, it is my honor to award these prizes to David Clark and Cade Minton. Gentlemen, please come forward. We now move to the President's Award for Academic Excellence. The President's Award for Scholarship and Character is presented to a junior who has excelled in the classroom at Hampton Sydney and who demonstrates the qualities and character that enriches the life of the campus community. We happen to have two extraordinary juniors worthy of the award this year. Our first recipient is heavily involved in the campus community and has excelled with his academics. He's an active member of both the varsity cross country team and crossover outdoor track team. Additionally, having been on the dean's list each semester with a cumulative grade point average of 4.0, this recipient is a two-time ODAC All-Academic Team recipient. Outside of athletics, this recipient is a head orientation leader, member of the college's Animation Society, Music Performance Club, Outsiders Club, Reenacting Club, Club Soccer, and Cycling Club. He's a great mentor to his peers and leads by example in all that he does. Joseph K. Minton, please come forward to accept the President's Award for, schol for Scholarship and Character.
next recipient is also very active in the life of the college in many ways. This recipient is a head resident advisor, a former member of the Tiger Pet Band, member of the Weightlifting Club, Phi Beta Lambda, the Phi Fishing Club, and a founding member of both the Hampton Sydney Blacksmithing Club and Hampton Sydney Beep. This recipient has been on the Dean's List each semester and has accumulated a grade point average of 3.9704. It is also worth noting that his, this recipient recently set a new Commonwealth of Virginia powerlifting record for his age and weight class. This recipient has served as a highly effective mentor to his peers and engages selflessly in service to, of the college and his brothers. William Preston Morris, please come forward to accept the President's Award for Scholarship and Character. Next on hand is a philosophy and government double major with a cumulative grade point average of 3.8836. Would you join me in recognizing the 2023 recipient of the President's Award for Academic Excellence in Humanities, Patrick Robert Streit. The President's Award for Academic Excellence in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics goes to a double major in Computer Science and Mathematics with minors in Astronomy and German. He carries a cumulative grade point average of 3.9484. I take great pleasure in presenting this award to John Atwood Torian. I'm pleased to present the President's Award for Academic Excellence in Social Sciences to a government major who has earned a cumulative grade point average of 3.9428. Please join me in congratulating John Michael Rowe. The final President's Award given for overall academic excellence goes to a government and philosophy double major and a classical studies minor with a cumulative grade point average of 3.9919. Would you please join me in recognizing the 2023 recipient of the President's Award for overall academic excellence, Daniel Robinson Nivens. I now invite Dr. Wileniak and Mr. Shomo to the lectern to present the Omicron Delta Kappa Award. Good evening. My name is Tommy Shomo, class of 1969, and <clears throat> I'm here with Omicron Delta Kappa coordinate, Coordinator uh, Michael Winsky and Lambda Circle President Patrick Streit to present this year's ODK Award, recognizing a student who has shown exceptional leadership and service potential through his first year at Hamden, Sydney. Omicron Delta Kappa is the nation's premier honor society dedicated to leadership and service. The Lambda Circle here at Hampton, Sydney is the nation's 11th oldest. Our ODK circle was founded on April the 12th, 1924, making 23-24 our centennial year. Over the next several months, we hope to highlight the many ways in which Lambda Circle of ODK provides opportunities for leadership and service and continues to be an important contributor to the college's mission to form good men and good citizens. Thank you, Tommy. The ODK scholarship has been presented for the past 50 years in honor of a rising sophomore, now a sophomore, who has shown outstanding leadership potential at the college. And now that we're at our centennial, the circle wishes to rechristen this award in honor to one of the circle's most loyal and dedicated sons. Uh, without question, this gentleman and his service to the college throughout his entire tenure here has been second to none. So as circle coordinator of ODK, I am proud to announce the rechristening of the ODK scholarship as the Thomas H. Shomo Class of 69 ODK Award for Academic uh, Leadership Potential. Without further ado, I ask our ODK president, Patrick Streit, to read the uh, proclamation that will be done from here forward and actually give out the award. 
Well, this is an honor for the first year to do this. The Thomas H. Shomo Class of 69 ODK Award for Leadership Potential was, a sla was established in 1974 to mark the 50th anniversary of our Lambda Circle and has been endowed by generous contributions from ODK alumni. This scholarship is awarded annually to one or more members of the sophomore class who demonstrated real leadership potential during their first year at the college. The award was renamed in 2023 on the occasion of the Circle's centennial in honor of Tommy Shomo, who for 32 years served Hampton Sydney as Assistant Dean of Students, Director of Financial Aid, Director of Public Relations, and Director of Marketing and Communications. Mr. Shomo also authored To Manor Born, To Manor's Bread, a hip pocket guide to etiquette for Hampton Sydney men, the definitive guide for how, as stated in the Hampton Sydney Code of Conduct, the Hampton Sydney student will behave as a gentleman at all times and in all places. This award stands as a perpetual reminder to the legacy of one of Hampton Sydney College's best examples of a good man and a good citizen. It is my great pleasure to announce that this year's recipients of the Shomo Award are Mr. Devin Modak and Mr. Jeb Tucker. Mr. Modak and Mr. Tucker, please come forward to receive this award. Rodney Ruffin, Hampton Sydney College, class of 82. Whew, that's really a long time ago. Huh? Um, and uh, with apologies to the English, uh, the members of the faculty who teach English and those of you who are English majors, Thomas Wolfe was wrong. You can come home again. I'm very happy to be here. As we begin a new academic year, the first for some of you, and as we launch a three-year celebration of the college's 250th anniversary, we need look no further than our speaker for an example of our mission fulfilled, a good man and a good citizen, a model of civic virtue in action. The Honorable Justice John Charles Thomas has shown us through his own lived experience that where you come from does not determine where you end up. From the humblest of beginnings in Norfolk, Virginia, he quickly displayed determination and a work ethic that defied his early age. Observing and learning from black men like his scoutmaster and school teachers, deacons in his church, men in his neighborhood, historical figures, and characters in novels, he was attentive to the different ways men carried themselves. He worked tenaciously in his education and in all his pursuits. As his grandmother had always told him, whatever your little hands find to do, do it well. He forged his path to the University of Virginia, where as one of three black students in his entering class in 1968, he earned his bachelor's degree with distinction in 1972 and his law degree in 1975. Even as a busy and industrious college student, he sought opportunities to lead and to serve. As a sophomore, he took over the role of president of the Black Students for Freedom, an organization that pushed for more diversity at UVA. And he developed a strong relationship with UVA, with then UVA President Edgar Shannon. He wrote to Virginia Governor Holton and asked to participate in the government of Virginia, and the governor appointed him to the Virginia Commission for Children and Youth. President Nixon appointed him to serve as co-chairman of the National Task Force on Education for the 1970 White House Conference on Youth. Of that experience, he said, and I urge all of you to take his advice, <clears throat> it makes a young person strong to debate his elders and to get to know them in the process. But to successfully engage in those debates, you have to do your homework. Read the reports and position papers, exchange ideas with those around you, and listen with care. In August of 1975, he became the first African-American lawyer hired by the formerly all-Caucasian Richmond law firm, Hunton Williams Gay and Gibson. 
and in 1983, Virginia Governor Ch Ch Charles Robb appointed him to the Supreme Court of Virginia, making him the first African American and at 32 years of age, the youngest justice in the history of the Commonwealth. In his memoir, The Poetic Justice, which I recommend highly for all of you to read. He describes his thoughts as he moved into the Supreme Court building and began reading the briefs that were awaiting him. He had experienced some of those thoughts before, as one of the only black children in a white school, as one of the only black students at UVA, as the first black lawyer in his law firm. He said, I felt that loneliness again, that feeling that nobody could help me, that I was in a do-or-die, sink-or-swim situation. I'd had that feeling more than once in my life because being lonely is a large part of being the first. It is a feeling that can either overwhelm you or motivate you. It motivated me to get ready. In 1989, a medical issue caused him to leave the court and return to the Hutton Law Firm as chief of the appellate practice group where he remained until his retirement in 2021. Justice Thomas has an impressive list of board service, has served many years as a judge of the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne, Switzerland, and has delivered numerous prominent lectures. But I want to remind you of the title of his memoir, The Poetic Justice. He is also a wonderful poet, and his voice will speak to your soul. Just as, just, just as Justice Thomas did, I hope you will find motivation in the challenges that you face. Work hard, prepare thoroughly and well to meet and overcome those challenges. I know that Justice Thomas's words today will motivate us all. Please join me in welcoming Justice John Charles Thomas. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. To the president of this wonderful college, to the senior administrators, to the members of the board, to the faculty and staff, to my wife who travels with me to all these many places around the country and the world, to two of the Reed leaders, presidents themselves, Taylor Reedley the third and the fourth, whose father and grandfather once once president of this college, I say thank you for having me here. This is an important occasion. Let's begin with the very name of the occasion. This is a convocation. This is no small, simple meeting. This is a calling together of the college and all of its facets for an important purpose. A convocation is on par with what the Catholic Church calls the conclave, where the cardinals meet to elect the Pope. It is not a simple thing. You come here because there's an important message that must must be given to you all assembled together, the whole college at one place, and I have a message for you today. We want to talk about what this college is meant to do. You are said to be a small liberal arts college, and if you ask somebody what that means, they will often say, well, that's the school that teaches you the basics. That's the school that teaches you a general education. That's the school that gives you a traditional learning, all that's wrong. Because sometimes in life, when you try to borrow a concept from another language, the meaning of what was there gets lost in translation. The Greeks talked about the arts liberalis, but those arts liberalis were related to other arts, the mechanical arts, the programming arts, the beautiful arts. Arts means skill and liberalis means freedom. 
And so this ain't nothing about a traditional or basic education. The Greeks had in mind teaching you the skills of freedom. Now, if we paid attention to that, we would want more to come to a place like this because what they were saying was you ought not be members of a democratic society unless you know the skills of freedom. And there were seven skills of freedom. They started with what they called the trivium, which comes from trivia, which is the crossing of three roads. It's grammar, logic, and rhetoric. In grammar, they wanted you to understand the language of the subjects that you were dealing with, the way the words are used, the vocabulary. Logic, they wanted you to be able to think and find the truth. Rhetoric, they wanted you to be to stand on your two legs and persuade others to the reasons that pr pr promote what you want to do, that lead you to go where you want to go. Logic, grammar, rhetoric, and then the Greeks, and boy, they could think of things. They thought about the structure of the world, and they thought the world was based on math, and so they came up with the quadrivium. And here they said, you need to study math, but then you need to study geometry. Now, what is that? They call that math in space. Then you need to study music, and they call that math in time. And then you needed to study astronomy. They call that math in time and space. But basically, they wanted you to know the structure of the world. Now, we have evolved from the five or 600 years ago when they thought of this, and we know more of structure. So courses like sociology and anthropology and biology go to teach you the structure of the world. For example, we know now in biology something about structure that they never knew because we know about DNA as part of biology. They had no concept of that, although they had thought about the atom. It did occur to the Greeks that you take a piece of stone and there comes a smaller and smaller part of it that gets down to what they call an atom. So they had gotten there in their minds, but they hadn't gotten to where we are. But when you know the kind of structure that they wanted you to know, and we know the kind of structure we know to day through DNA, you come upon startling revelations. One of the things that strikes me most about structure in the Greek sense and now in our modern scientific sense is that one of the things that we have fought over the most, killed people over the most, destroyed whole towns and villages over, is the color of our skin. But oddly enough, if you look at the writings and the science of the human genome, you will find out that the difference in the color of skin of humans is the smallest difference between us. In that ironic, the thing that looks like it's the biggest deal is the least deal. You will find that it takes more genetic coding to shape your earlobe than it does to change the color of your skin. It takes more genetic coding to shape your hairline than it does to determine the color of your skin. And so I wonder whether in the times that we have lived and people have lived before us, whether because we didn't understand this structure about the nature of mankind, we have thrown away the answers to problems that we have prayed about. You know, in the Amazon jungle, they say thousands of acres are destroyed every day by the tearing up for construction and so forth. But we also know that they find medicines in those plants, do they not? They find cures to diseases in those plants. We have destroyed whole sections of humanity because of their skin color. And I just wonder whether when we see God and we say, God, we prayed for somebody who could help us overcome global warming. We prayed for somebody who could solve the crisis in the Middle East. We prayed for somebody who would overcome poverty. God and his wisdom is going to tell you, I sent him. That little black baby on that second boat that came from Africa in 1619, that was going to be the, the, per, the person whose descendants would know the answer to these problems. Just as we've clear cut whole forests for our present day demand, we have wiped out what I think might be some of the great answers to the problems that we deal with. And so, the Greeks to 
to get back to where we started. We're talking about the skills of freedom. They did not want you to be a member of a society where you could be led by the nose. This actually relates to the founding of America, which is very near the founding of this college, because the original plan for those who could vote was educated men and land-owning men, not everybody, which is, seems like, well, that's anti-democratic. But what they were afraid of was that if you had people who did not understand what they were voting on, did not understand the importance of issues, did not understand the structure of the government, they could be led by the nose, made to do anything. And so Jefferson is the one who said, the person who thinks that he can be both ignorant and free thinks what never was and what never shall be. We urge you as you come to this great college on this hillside that has classmates who've already stood up for others in tough situations that you will become the kind of citizen who will use your insight and your logic to find the truth, who will understand the importance of rhetoric to persuade others in a proper way, who will be able to examine problems and say this answer is the right one and this answer is the wrong one because part of what you're doing when you do that is sharing light. Education pushes back darkness and it lets you see the light. But when you find the light, guess what? The candle that lights another candle burns no less brightly. What does that mean? You can walk into a darkened arena that has 50,000 people in it everybody holding a candle and you can come in with your one candle and you can touch that candle and that candle can touch the next candle and that candle can touch the next candle and before you know it you got 50,000 candle power that started from your one candle. The candle that lights another candle burns no less brightly. You lose nothing when you share the light. You lose no part of yourself when you share understanding. You lose no part of your soul or your spirit when you help others through the knowledge that you have acquired at a place like this. And so I am praying and hoping that this is the course that you will set for yourself, that you will be part of spreading the light. It is so important, so much for these times, for this moment, for now, to get back to a proper understanding of the role of a citizen. You are supposed to be able to stand up and debate. You are supposed to be able to persuade with words. You are supposed to be able to seek out the truth. And so I tell you from my own poem, you need to light the soul. Light lay quietly at the beginning till it was called into action by God. Then it split the darkness, warmed the cold, brought motion to the stillness, touched our souls, and they say there is light at the end. As we brace ourselves for the final journey, the word is there is light even then, light that binds you binds you, then sets you free. From Alpha to Omega, the light shines through. From dawn to dusk, it orders what we do. By particle and wave, it prompts the birds to sing. By pulse and reflection, it points out the way. Light can lift depression, dispel despair, bring hope to the weary, lead us from fear. Light can raise up emotions, quiet the storm, beckon us from rolling seas into the calm. We learn by light, we grow by light, we sit in the dark, transfixed by its sight. And as the light flickers, our hearts respond. We can see the connections, we can feel the bonds. It has been given to some to handle the light, to mold it, to craft it, to bend it to right. It has fallen to some to sculpt what we see, to sharpen, to brighten, 
to make it run free to those who would hold light in their hands there is much to remember to understand in the right light love can shine in the right light we can leave wrong behind by the light there is good we can know in the light justice can grow. Now talking about justice, Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I love that. It was in the sermon when people were asking how long do we have to have this kind of broken America? How long has there got to be prejudice when he said not long because truth crushed the earth will rise again. Not long because a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. Not long because the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice. But the point I have to make for you all is this. The arc of the moral universe don't move by itself. The arc of the moral universe moves when you lean into the arc and you push it. That's what I hope I'll find in this assembly today. Young men who when they leave this place and they see injustice, they will lean into the arc and push it towards justice. I believe that you can be all that you can be. I believe that you can be young men who can change the whole world. I believe that you can make it so that when you see God, he says, you did a good job, son. God bless you. Thank you for that wonderful address. It's now my great privilege. Yes, please be seated. To Prince Judge Thomas with an honorary degree. I'll now read the citation. The Honorable John Charles Thomas is both a lawyer and a poet, as we have just seen. He is also a skilled orator and a model of tenacity, resilience, courage, and virtue. A retired senior partner of the law firm Hunt and Andrews and & Kurth, he was the first African American as well as the youngest justice to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Virginia. His life story is one of hard work and determination, of focus and exacting preparation, of challenges overcome and great accomplishments. He has honed skills that we admire and seek to instill in our students, and he has used these skills and his formidable intellect and talents to better every situation and organization he has encountered, and to serve with distinction this commonwealth, our country, and his fellow human beings. Now, therefore, in recognition of your civic virtue and your manifold contributions to society, by the authority vested in me by the trustees of Hampton Sydney College and under the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa, with the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereunto appertaining, in token of which we present you with this diploma and the academic could appropriate to this degree. Welcome to the Brotherhood, Judge Thomas. Thank you so much, Mr. President.
brothers and sisters, go into this night understanding that you are a part of this campus, this institution, and indeed all of creation. And that remembrance go out to be your brothers and sisters keepers so that all will flourish and grow into the best person that you can be. Go now in peace. Go now in love. Go now in hope. Amen. Amen.